So my name is Renee Walker. I'm the General Manager of Customer Solutions at IAG. So I am representing IAG, um, but most of these things that I say will be relevant for most insurers. There might be some points that you want to talk directly to your insurer about if you're not insured with IAG, but also if you've got questions at the end, I may be able to help them with you or I'll be able to point you to the right direction, to the right person at your insurer. So, what I'm going to speak about tonight is a number of things that have been put to us from the In The Know Hub. So, these are questions that other customers have come into the Hub with or posted online. And it's really about, so I'm not talking about cash settlement versus other um, reinstatement options or other settlement options. I'm just focusing on cash settlement tonight. So, a cash settlement, it's really important to know that it is based on what can be assessed at the time of assessment and how much your insurer estimates it would cost to reinstate this. So, what's important about that statement is if there's areas that you're concerned about with your property that you don't think can be assessed without invasive assessment, then you would ask your insurer about those. So, it is based on what we can see and what we can assess at the time. And all insurers will want to have a conversation with you. So, if you've got concerns, raise them so that they can look into it for you. It is generally a full and final payment and Sarah might touch on this from the legal perspective. The reason it says that it's full and final is not all settlements are full and final. And again, if you had areas of concern, that's where you might raise those with your insurer and you might want to look at a partial discharge rather than a full and final. The important thing to know about that is your insurer, it will be one or the other. So if it's a full and final payment, there may be contingencies allowed for any unforeseen costs that come up later. If you sign a partial discharge, there usually wouldn't be contingencies allowed. So what you really want to think about at the start of the process is what is your intention? And your intention will probably shape the type of settlement discussion you want to have with your insurer. If your intention is to reinstate and you're go you've got foundations that you're concerned about and you are definitely going to reinstate, then you might say, actually, I'll sign a partial discharge because I want to keep foundations out of that. But if your intention, if you're not sure of what your intention is at the time, you might say, yes, I I am going to reinstate but if in the back of your mind you might be thinking well I am going to reinstate at this point in time but in the future if something changes I might choose to buy an existing home instead you might choose to take a full and final settlement which includes contingencies but it really it's just about what is your intention at the time that you choose to settle your claim. Once you've accepted the payment, if you go for a full and final discharge, once you've accepted, that claim generally can't be reopened even if extra costs are found. So that's where you just want to be very certain that everything's been captured, you've signed off the scope of works, you've signed off the cost to reinstate those scope of works at the time if you're signing that full and final discharge. And there's plenty of people to go to for advice on that. Sarah is from the Residential Advisory Service and she will speak after me about um, cash settlements. But we do recommend that people go and speak to the residential advisory service or that you speak to your lawyer. First instance, speak to your bank and Mark from BNZ will touch on that as well. But if you're concerned about the settlement that your insurer has given you or just if you want to get advice, there's a number of services that are available. If you need to move out during your reinstatement, most policies will have an alternative accommodation payment as part of the policy. If you haven't already used that and some people will have used that if you've already been out of your home. If you haven't already used it, it will be included as part of your settlement. Now, if you're an undercap repair or rebuild, your insurer will ask for a letter about your scope of works from Fletcher's and then will estimate how long you'll be out of your home and pay you an alternative accommodation payment based on that time that you're going to be out. If your home's a rebuild with your insurer, for most home rebuilds, it will take a period of time. So usually the maximum alternative accommodation payment would be included but it is really how much is the allowance. For most IAG policies, it's $20,000. For some other policies, it's a percentage of your contents cover. So speak to your insurer about what cover you have under your policy and then what will be included as part of that cash settlement. Um, inflation costs, so this was one of the questions that came through, um, was if you accept the cash settlement and then you build a year later and prices have increased, can you come back to your insurer for inflation? No, basically, because you've got the cash settlement, it's in the bank, it's earning interest. Um, it is, as I said, based on at the time of settlement. So generally, there wouldn't be any inflation paid. Um, where you might ask for inflation or it might be included is if the assessment was done six months ago and then you're settling today, 
then your insurer should probably include inflation from the time of assessment to the time of settlement. The only reason they wouldn't is if that delay has been at your request, but if it's just been through the process of negotiating six months has passed, then inflation for that time would generally be included. So once you've cash settled and agreed the scope of damage and associated cost, what a cash settlement enables you to do is manage your reinstatement in your own time frame. So in the past, insurers have had programs of work that have been three, four, five years long and if people weren't ready to go through the reinstatement process, you could choose to wait three or four years. Most insurers are now at the point where our reinstatement programs are starting, we're starting to see the end of those reinstatement programs, but we understand that there's people that are not ready to reinstate at this point in time. So a cash settlement allows you to manage that when you want to in your own time frame. The other thing is a lot of insurers at the start of our program allowed people to make major changes to their, ha to their homes. And what ended up happening is that we, we became almost like project management companies and we were managing the rebuild of a three bedroom luxury house instead of the five bedroom home that was there. And actually what we need to do is help you reinstate the damage that was caused by the earthquake. So now most insurers if they are reinstating through those programs, their programs will reinstate exactly what they had. They won't allow you to make any changes. So therefore, if you do want to make changes, a cash settlement's a way to go to um, manage that. Also, there's options available like selling or retaining your home or land and buying existing houses or rebuilding. I had a conversation with someone this afternoon and she said to me, I've never wanted to rebuild a house. A lot of people are in the situation, never wanted to build a home and don't ever want to. So what a cash settlement does allow you to do is to either sell the home as is, and we're seeing the market is flooded at the moment with as is sales, but build somewhere else or buy an existing house somewhere else. The other thing is that you can reinstate your home, as I said, in your own time frame. So these are some of the questions that were put forward to me from the In The Know Hub. And one of them was, what are the differences between purchasing another property elsewhere and rebuilding on the property when calculating a cash settlement? And this again comes back to that question about intention. So if you intend to reinstate on site, then all costs that would be incurred in that reinstatement will be included. So if, for example, you live on a hill site, you've got retaining walls, you've got um, site specific foundations that are needed, you you have things that are needed as a result of the site and your intention at the time of cash settlement is to reinstate there, then all of those things will be included. If you are purchasing elsewhere and you're not going to incur the costs to fix those retaining walls or fix the site specific foundations, then those costs may not be included. So what you really need to talk to your insurer about is your intention at the time. If you are unsure and actually you just wanted to settle with your insurer and make your decision in your own time frame, then you, you would just have an honest conversation with your insurer about that. But you'd probably want to say to them, well, I don't know what I'm going to do at the moment. I may reinstate on site because you don't want to be left in the situation that you do go to reinstate on site and you haven't been paid for all of those elements that you're then going to incur. But there, that's why there is a difference if you ha depending on your intention. Um, what will be included and excluded in each different option? Now, again, I'm talking about our IAG settlement, so I can't talk with conviction about all other insurance companies, but I can talk about what we do. So each settlement is a separate negotiation, and some of these things will be included or not included, depending, again, on that intention and the conversation. So inflation may be included if it's from the time of assessment to the time of settlement. Project management costs really depends on what you're going to do. So if you're going to go with a group home builder, like an Orange Homes or a Golden Homes, they have project managers that work with you. So therefore, we probably wouldn't include additional project management fees in the settlement because there's a project manager there. If you're going to deal with a builder who doesn't have a project manager assigned to them, then we may include project management fees in the settlement. But it really is, again, about having that conversation. Um, foundations, so costs are included for the foundations if they have to be repaired and again it would depend on what type of foundations you need. For all TC3 settlements, if the foundations are damaged, you should be getting a settlement for your TC3 foundations. There's a question that's come up a couple of times and I'm not sure if it's because there's other insurers that aren't including it, but we would expect, well we would include it in our settlements if it's a TC3 site and we would expect that you would have it in any other settlement. Um, expert reports. So in some cases you might have a different view from your insurer. Um, 
with IAG, and I'm sure many other insurers would do this, if you have your own expert report that changes the outcome of your insurance claim with us, we will reimburse you for that report. So if we've said that your house is repairable and you then go and um, get a, your own engineer who says actually it's a rebuild, we would obviously need to peer review the report, but if it's from a reputable engineer and we've legitimately missed something and it changes the outcome, we will reimburse you for that engineer and we will settle based on your report. So again, have that conversation with your insurer. Many insurers will do that and I think people feel stuck because they feel like the outcome being offered to them is not right, but there are options available and as I say, in many cases you will be reimbursed those costs. How long will it take to process or sort each of these above options? So with a cash settlement, in IAG's case, we had a conversation with the customer today, agreed a number, the money will be in their bank by early next week. It's easy once you get to the point that you're having the conversation about the dollar figure. Where the time is incurred is in getting all of the reports. So it's really hard to answer that because it depends on where each claim is at. If it's just come over cap from EQC, we're, seeing, we're still seeing claims come over. Um, some of those settlements can be quick because if you've been working with EQC, you may have your own builder appointed as part of the EQC process. You're actually happy with the reports. You're happy with the costs that they've got, but it just happens to go over cap. Have that conversation with your insurer because we, in many cases, we can settle on those reports that you've got because there's enough information there. If we don't know that you're happy with those, then we would go into our own assessment process and that on average does take between three to six months. And the reason for that is we're waiting for engineering reports, we're getting our own geotechnical structural engineering. Um, in the cases of the cash settlements that we're doing at the moment, they're very detailed, so we have asbestos reports if we need them, we have roofing reports, we have drainage reports and all of those things come from different people and do take time to coordinate. So right up front, it's good if, the, if you've got information about your property that you're confident about, it is good to let your insurer know that and then you can start that negotiation and maybe cut down some of that assessment time frame. And what if I'd already started the process of rebuild repair with my insurer before they decided to cash settle me? Was all that prep work for nil or can I continue with it somehow? So... The short answer to that would be no, it's not for nothing. And um, one of our options that we have is what we call a builder-assisted settlement. And with a builder-assisted settlement, there's people that have been working with the builder, quite happy with the builder, quite happy with the plans. And so we would continue to work with the homeowner up until the point that the contract is signed. And then the only difference between us managing that repair or rebuild or it becoming a builder-assisted settlement is at that time of contract signing, the, instead of us paying the money to the builder, we pay it to you and you pay the builder at milestones throughout the build process. So the short answer to that is if the, all the preparation work's been done and you want to continue with the repair or rebuild that your insurer was going to manage, you would just ask for all of those plans, they'd become yours and you'd work directly with the builder. So seeking advice, as I said before, it's really important even before you get to the point that you're just looking at numbers on a piece of paper, it's really important that you seek independent advice about what's going to be right for you. And one of the things that RAS does that's really good is looks at the different options that are available and helps you work through them. So if I was to keep my property and do the repairs and sell it in five years, this is what that would look like. If I was to take the cash settlement and sell it as is, this is what that would look like. If I was to reinstate, this is what that would look like. And I think that's a really valuable process to go through. Your bank is going to have an interest in any settlement that you're looking at. So have a conversation with them before you even entertain the idea of a cash settlement because they'll tell you what they are interested in and what they will allow you to do based on borrowings against the property. Um, talk to your insurer's sales team and I'll talk through this in a moment about why this is really important but a lot of people I think look at repairs for example and think okay well I'll cash settle on the repair but I won't worry about doing them because my house is quite fine, I'm happy to live with the cracks or whatever it is. That's okay, but your bank will have an interest in that, as will we, because it is still decreasing the value of the property, and if there's lending on that, then the bank might say that you do need to affect those repairs. The other thing is we will extend cover on repairs for a certain period of time, but we do still want to know that you're undertaking those repairs. So it is important to speak to the sales team before you take a cash settlement just to work out what that's going to mean for ongoing cover. 
If you have a broker, discuss it with them because that's what you pay them for essentially. So they should be able to help you look at any offer that you've got and work out what is best for you. Um, as I said earlier, there's a lot of as is, where is sales at the moment. So speaking to a real estate professional is a good idea because they can give you an idea of what similar houses are selling for. And also if you spent the money on repairing the property, what you might get in the future. And that's it really about saying, well, if we're going to do a repair for $500,000 and you could sell the house for $300,000 before the earthquake, are you going to be able to sell it for any more with a $500,000 repair done or does it not make economic sense? But a real estate agent can give you advice on that. Um, and as I said before, your lawyer will be able to talk you through any legal implications of a cash settlement. So ongoing insurance, once you cash settle, the insurance policy on your home is reviewed at that time. And so the ongoing cover will depend on whether you've cash settled on a repair or rebuild. And I do have fact sheets about this that you can take away because it's quite a lot to take in, but I thought it was just an important thing to cover. So if you cash settle on a rebuild, your existing cover is cancelled. And I mean, that's pretty simple. If the house is worth $500,000 and we pay $500,000 for it, there's nothing left to insure. So the cover is cancelled at that time. As the owner of the property though, there may be an option to extend your contents cover for liability. And this is something that you would discuss with the sales team at the time of settlement. And then once the rebuild is complete, we will reinstate cover. So if you've been an IAG customer, this was something that was of concern a couple of years ago when insurers weren't offering new cover. But if you're an IAG customer and there's no events that change the landscape in between the time we settle and the time you rebuild, then we will reinstate cover. What we would need is a code of compliance certificate to say that the home has been rebuilt and it's all consentable. In the case of a repair, we will continue to insure the home for a certain period of time. So if the home is insured for $500,000 and we cash settle $150,000 of damage, then your sum insured policy would reduce to $350,000 and you would pay a premium based on that $350,000. Now, we would come back to you, so we'll continue to insure the property until the first renewal. And if the first renewal is within six months, we'll do it to the second renewal. But in that time, we'll come back to you to check that you've made some kind of, taken some kind of action to repair the damage. And if no action's been taken, then we'll review the policy. And there is a chance at that time that the policy will be cancelled altogether because the money that has been paid is to fix the damage. So we'd want to know that something's been done to, to um, take action to fix that damage. And again, to reinstate cover on a repair, it depends whether the repair is consentable or exempt work or cosmetic damage. So if a consent's required, then we'd want evidence that that work has been done and that evidence would be a code of compliance certificate. For structural damage where there's no consent, we'd want to see the scope of works and you can use the scope of works that we have given you as part of the settlement process, but we'd also want producer statements. So an engineering statement that says this is a work that needs to be done, which is a PS1 statement and then a PS4 that says yes the work was done in um, in alliance with the work that needed to be done with the scope of works and then for cosmetic damage we just want a statement from the tradesperson who carried out the work or photographs and receipts to show that the work has been done. I'm going to hand over to Sarah at this point and then I will answer questions at the end. If they're really specific about your property, I will be here afterwards. So don't feel like you have to get everything out in front of everyone if you're not comfortable because I will hang around and answer those for you. So hi everyone, I'm Sarah Henderson from the Residential Advisory Service. Um, I'm one of the independent advisors and lawyers there. Um, I, I'm going to do it a little bit differently to this. What I'm going to do is from the very first steps that you need to take when you've been offered a cash settlement. So the first thing you need to do is you need to make sure that you've got all the information. Now there's a lot of information that you'll need to get from your insurer and also from EQC or the council um, on your limb file. So you're going to need your insurance policy and your policy schedule that was in place at the time of the earthquakes. You're going to need any business practices from your insurer, so any booklets they've given you about the settlement process so you can understand what they might offer outside of the insurance policy. 
you're then going to need all the scope of works that were on the claim. So you might have been given a cash settlement offer, but they might not give you the scope of works that they've actually based that on. It might just be one page with the number there, but you don't know how that number was populated. So what you do is you ask for the, the current costed scope of works um, and any previous ones so you can see what changes have been made between them. Um, you're going to need any surveyors reports that the insurer might carry out. So there are a lot of different types of surveyors. So there's a quantity surveyor and they work out the cost um, of actually carrying out the work. Um, there's land surveyors. Um, also there might be a building surveyor. Um, there might be ground penetrating radar if you've got a concrete slab. So you want to ask for those documents. You also want to ask for any engineering reports. So you're going to have geotech um, engineering and structural engineering reports. So then about the land, you're going to need to know what type of property you're sitting on. So are you fee simple or are you part of a cross lease? Because if you're part of a cross lease, then you've got obligations to the other neighbours um, that we need to know if you're going to seek any advice about it. Um, you want to know what TC category you are. So one, two or three, or if you're in the Port Hills um, area. Um, and you want to check with the geotech report, has that TC category be confirmed? Because sometimes you might be classified as a TC3, but actually your site has TC2 properties or the other way around. Um, you want to check with the council if you're a hail site, so if you might have land contamination on your site. You also want to check if there's any changes in the fixed floor levels um, on your property. So you want to call the council and ask them what fixed floor level, if I rebuilt the foundations, does it need to be at? Um, and if you're in a flood management area, because there are a lot of changes recently and you might be in a flood management area now if you weren't before. Um, so there's separate things that you want to ask um, from EQC as well. So you want to see if you're considered increased flooding vulnerability or increased liquefaction vulnerability. And if you're either of those, um, you want all the documents from EQC about um, how they're determining that. Um, you want to see if you've got a code of compliance as well. That helps sometimes um, if... Uh, they're trying to exclude anything for reasons of not having consent or there's something wrong with some part of your property. Um, and then you want to check what information have you obtained already. So have you had an engineering report? Um, have you had a builder come and have a look at it? Um, have you got any property reports on your file for when you bought the house? Because it might have a bit of a description about um, what quality the house was at the time. So once you've got all that information, that's when you decide, who am I going to go and talk to to help with the claim? Um, so am I comfortable doing this on my own? Am I comfortable going to the insurer and talking to them? Um, do I need something more formal? So do I need um, someone advocated for me? Do I need a lawyer? Um, do I need an earthquake support coordinator to be there or a family member? Um, do you have any builder friends that might be able to help? Um, or do you want to obtain a builder or a quantity surveyor or engineer to help you? So you need to start thinking about how far you're willing to go to make sure that it's accurate and you've got all the information you need. So how much do you understand about how it all works? Because um, it's not as simple as that you're being over cap and then suddenly you're with your insurer. There's still a lot more involvement with EQC depending on the different types of claims. Um, so you've got your residential building claim so if you're over cap, then that's, you're only dealing with your insurer. But EQC is still involved because they'll be dealing with your contents claim for up to $20,000. They'll also be dealing with your land claim. Um, and then you have to think about other things like your temporary accommodation, which is with your insurer, and your out of scope works, which is your fences, driveways and paths are always with your insurer, even if you're under cap. So after that, and you've decided who you want to go talk to, so you might want to talk to your private solicitor who helped you with your property, or um, you want to talk to someone who works actually exclusively in earthquake insurance, so either the lawyers at Residential Advisory Service, um, or one of the lawyers you might have seen speak or work in the area. Um, maybe some um, insurance advocacy services like CS or an earthquake support coordinator as well. Maybe you've got friends who've gone through this process before that are willing to help you go through it because it can be quite daunting. And then you want to start thinking about what do you intend to do? What, what are the options available to you and 
what ones have you excluded completely? So can you go through rebuilding the house? If you can, so you keep that one open, but then you look at all the other options as well and what the insurer is offering you. Does the insurer let you um, negotiate something outside of your policy? So your policy is going to say what you're entitled to, but the insurers have actually developed um, different policies about what else you might be able to do. So they might be a bit negotiable on... Um, what you intend to do. For example, um, I've had a client who they were paid out on a rebuild, um, but they decided that financially, after talking to the bank, the real estate agent, they could get a repair that would get a code of compliance, and then they were allowed to use that money to go buy another house as well. So they repaired the house, they reinsured it, and then they bought another house. And that was financially better for them than rebuilding the whole thing from that particular site. So you need to start brainstorming with people about what might be better financially for you, stress-wise, um, time-wise, because some things are faster than others. Um, getting all the reports are going to take a long time, um, but you, it might be more important for you for a peace of mind that you get exactly what you're entitled to, and other people it's more important that you just have it settled um, and it's over with. So you want to go through what's more important for you. Um, what is the insurer proposing to settle on? So have they said that you're repairable? Um, or have they said that you're a total loss? And, and for what reason? So um, was it uneconomic? Is it because the engineer said you can't actually repair it and get a consent? Um, is it impractical? So you can't lift the house on the site because you might need to go into the neighbour's site or something like that. And then do you agree? So you go through all those documents and if you've obtained your own experts, do they agree with the insurer? Um, what's the points of contention um, and how are you going to try and resolve them and what, what forum do you want to do that in? So do you want to do it by email? Do you want to go and meet the insurer? Do you want to go with your lawyer and try to figure something out? Do you want a mediation? Just start thinking about what you'd be most comfortable in. Um, and then assessing it. So that's when you decide, okay, um, you look at the number and you think, if I'm not going to rebuild it, am I comfortable with that number? Um, or have I talked to the bank and they've said, well, if it's 20000 more, this is probably a good deal for you to go with. So you need to start thinking about those things as well. Um, do you intend to reinstate the home exactly or do you want to make some changes? Um, again, the cross-lease property is really important, so you need to start talking to your neighbours about that, as, as well as any shared driveways or, or any shared ownership of lanes or anything like that around you. Um, and then negotiating, it, negotiating the offer. So if you're looking at it, you might want to go through it yourself and say, has everything been included? So if you're in a rebuild, um, have all the special items been included? So, so the additional add-ons that... Um, make your home a bit more expensive than just a group home? Are they all there? Um, can you identify them? Or do you want someone else to go through the house with you um, and make sure that everything's there? So a quantity surveyor or a licensed building practitioner would do that. So they'd come round to the house um, and check that everything's been included and that the market rates are right. Do you want to get an engineer? Um, are you worried about... Um, what foundation option, or if it's a repair for that foundation, are you worried that that's not accurate? Because then you have to go and talk to an engineer um, and see and get them to either review the report um, or create their own report. Um, and then what fees have, have been included? Um, sometimes those fees are omitted, um, so you want to look for contingencies. Um, contingencies don't just cover unforeseen variations, they also cover weather-related delays, um, they cover a lot of things that you want to make sure that contingency is actually there. You want to check that there's enough there for your professional um, fees, like your structural and your geotech. Um, check whether you might need a land surveyor if you're in a flood management area. Um, design and consent fees should be there. Um, demolition costs, um, inflation, um, project management fees. So if your house wasn't a group home at the time, so it's a character home, then you should be entitled to project management fees. Um, any policy specific additions, so check for landscaping things. So you might have a sublimit on your policy that says actually you get an extra 2,500 for any landscaping. Um, you might have a stress allowance. Um, look to see whether you need um, any money for retaining walls and if you're covered for those. 
Um, check that excesses have been applied correctly as well. Um, and also see whether you can get any costs back. So if you went and got an engineer's report, and like Renee said, um, it ended up changing EQCs on the insurer's mind, um, you want to make sure that that's been added on to the settlement figure. And then look at the terms of the cash settlement agreement. So does it reflect what you are actually going to do? Um, so if you're actually going to reinstate, does it say there that you get all those costs? Um, or are you doing something different? And you can just ask them to change that term. Um, how risk averse are you? So are you really worried that you're not going to have enough money um, and you actually intend to reinstate? In that circumstance, I would tell people not to settle um, until you've had your bill to go through and you've got a build contract. Um, other times you might not be sure, but you know that if you had a certain period amount of money that you'd be okay with it. You'd be okay with walking away. Um, does the agreement allow you to return and do you want to return if the, um, the amount exceeds that cash settlement? So you might want to carve out the foundations or have the insurer carry out the foundation part but have everything else um, closed off for the cash settlement. Are you required to sign a statutory declaration saying what you intend to do? Um, and are you, have you been requested to sign a deed of assignment um, and does it include both the build, building and the land? Um, and then also I'll get you to check your land claim with EQC. So do you have a flat lands claim um, and have you been paid out for that? And what has it been based on? Um, and also, again, if you are increased flooding vulnerability or increased liquefaction vulnerability. Then check your um, temporary accommodation entitlements. The insurer might pay that out um, without having to have any proof that you are going to incur them. Um, and also check your contents. So if your contents are going to be over the 20,000 from EQC, you'll have to get the top up from your insurer.